Thank you, Annette, um, who I knew when I was about eight years old. I think she probably babysat for me, uh, which leads to another introduction, which is of my eight-year-old, Julia, who's sitting in the audience and is <clears throat> showing me around Chicago, where she's never been before. Um, I'm actually at the Atlantic now. I was at the New Yorker until December. Little fact checking there. Um, but they're both amazing magazines. So I'm going to read a bit from the prologue of Our Man, Richard Holbrook and the End of the American Century, and then talk a bit about it and then uh, answer whatever questions you might have about the book and the, the topic. Holbrook? Yes, I knew him. I can't get his voice out of my head. I still hear it saying, you haven't read that book? You really need to read it. Saying, I feel, and I hope this doesn't sound too self-satisfied, that in a very difficult situation where nobody has the answer, I at least know what the overall questions and moving parts are. Saying, gotta go, Hillary's on the line. That voice, calm, nasal, a trace of older New York, a sing-song cadence when he was being playful, but always doing something to you. Cajoling, flattering, bullying, seducing, needling, analyzing, one-upping you, applying continuous pressure like a strong underwater current so that by the end of a conversation, even two minutes on the phone, you found yourself far out from where you'd started, unsure how you got there, and mysteriously exhausted. He was six feet one, but seemed bigger. He had long, skinny limbs and a barrel chest and broad, square shoulder bones, on top of which sat his strangely small head and encased within it the sleepless brain. His feet were so far from his trunk that as his body wore down and the blood stopped circulating properly, they swelled up and became marbled red and white like steak. He had special shoes made and carried extra socks in his leather attache case, sweating through half a dozen pairs a day, stripping them off on long flights and draping them over his seat pocket in first class, or else cramming used socks next to the classified documents in his briefcase. He wrote his book about ending the war in Bosnia, the, piece, the place in history that he always craved, though it was never enough, with his feet planted in a Brookstone Shiatsu foot massager. One morning, he showed up late for a meeting in the Secretary of State's suite at the Waldorf Astoria in his stocking feet, shirt untucked and fly half zipped, padding around the room and picking grapes off a fruit basket while Madeleine Albright's furious stare tracked his every move. During a video conference call from the UN mission in New York, his feet were propped up on a chair, while down in the White House Situation Room, their giant distortion completely filled the wall screen and so disrupted the meeting that President Clinton's national security advisor finally ordered a military aide to turn off the video feed. Holbrook put his feet up anywhere, in the White House, on other people's desks and coffee tables, for relief and for advantage. Near the end, it seemed as if all his troubles were collecting in his feet. Atrial fibrillation, marital tension, thwarted ambition, conspiring colleagues, hundreds of thousands of air miles, corrupt foreign leaders, a war that would not yield to the relentless force of his will. But at the other extreme from his feet, the ice blue eyes were on perpetual alert. Their light told you that his intelligence was always awake and working. They captured nearly everything and gave almost nothing away. Like one-way mirrors, they looked outward, not inward. I never knew anyone quicker to size up a room, an adversary, a newspaper article, a set of variables in a complex situation, even his own imminent death. The ceaseless appraising told of a manic spirit 
churning somewhere within the low voice and languid limbs. Once in the 1980s, he was walking down Madison Avenue when an acquaintance passed him and called out, Hi, Dick. Holbrook watched the man go by, then turned to his companion. I wonder what he meant by that. <laughs> yes, his curly hair never obeyed the comb, and his suit always looked rumpled, and he couldn't stay off the phone or TV, and he kept losing things, and he ate as much food as fast as he could, once slicing open the tip of his nose on a clamshell and bleeding through a pair of cloth napkins. Yes, he was in almost every way a disorderly presence, but his eyes never lost focus. So much thought, so little inwardness. He could not be alone. He might have had to think about himself. Maybe that was something he couldn't afford to do. Leslie Gelb, Holbrook's friend of 45 years and recipient of multiple daily phone calls, would butt into a monologue and ask, what's Obama like? Holbrook would give a brilliant analysis of the president. How do you think you affect Obama? Holbrook had nothing to say. Where did it come from, that blind spot behind his eyes that masked his inner life? It was a great advantage over the rest of us because the propulsion from idea to action was never broken by self-scrutiny. It was also a great vulnerability. And finally, it was fatal. I can hear the voice saying, it's your problem now, not mine. He loved speed. Franz Klammer's fearless downhill run for the gold in 1976 was a feat Holbrook never finished admiring until you almost believed that he had been the one throwing himself into those dangerous turns at Innsbruck. He pedaled his bike straight into a swarming Saigon intersection while talking about the war to a terrified blonde journalist just arrived from Manhattan. He zipped through Paris traffic while lecturing his State Department boss on the status of the Vietnam peace talks. His Humvee careered down the dirt switchbacks of the Mount Igman Road above besieged Sarajevo, chased by the armored personnel carrier with his doomed colleagues. He loved mischief. It made him endless fun to be with and got him into unnecessary trouble. In 1967, he was standing outside Robert McNamara's office on the second floor of the Pentagon, a 26-year-old junior official hoping to catch the Secretary of Defense on his way in or out for no re reason other than self-advancement. A famous colonel was waiting, too, a decorated paratrooper back from Vietnam where Holbrook had known him. Everything about the colonel was pressed and creased, his uniform shirt, his face, his pants carefully tucked into his boots and delicately bloused around the calves. He must have spent the whole morning on them. That looks really beautiful, Holbrook said, and he reached down and yanked a pants leg all the way out of its boot. The colonel started yelling and Holbrook laughed. Back in the Kennedy and Johnson years, when he was elbowing his way into public life, the phrase action intellectuals was hot until Vietnam caught up with it and the intellectuals got burned. But that was Holbrook. Ideas mattered to him, but never for their own sake, only if they produced solutions to problems. The only problems worth his time were the biggest, hardest ones. Three fiendish wars, that's what his career came down to. He was almost singular in his eagerness to keep risking it. Having solved Bosnia, he wanted Cyprus, Kosovo, Congo, the Horn of Africa, Tibet, Iran, India, Pakistan, and finally Afghanistan. Only the Middle East couldn't tempt him. As the Washington bureaucracy got more cautious, his appetite for conquests grew. Right after his death, Hillary Clinton said, I picture him like Gulliver, tied down by Lilliputians. He loved history so much that he wanted to make it. The phrase great man now sounds anachronistic, but as an inspiration for human striving, maybe we shouldn't throw out the whole idea. He came of age when there was still a place for it, and that place could only be filled by an American. This was just after the war, when the ruined world 
lay prone and open to the visionary action of figures like Acheson, Kennan, Marshall, and Harriman. They didn't just grab for land and gold like the great men of earlier empires. They built the structures of international order that would endure for three generations longer than anything lasts and that are only now turning to rubble. These were unsentimental, supremely self-assured, white Protestant men, privileged, you could say, born around the turn of the century who all knew one another and knew how to get things done. They didn't take a piss without a strategy. Holbrook revered them all and adopted a few as replacement fathers. He wanted to join them at the top and he clawed his way up the slope of an establishment that was crumbling under his crampons. He reached the highest base camp possible, but every assault on the summit failed. He loved books about mountaineers, and in his teens he climbed the Swiss Alps. He was a romantic. He never realized that he had come too late. You will have heard that he was a monstrous egotist. It's true. It's even worse than you've heard. I'll explain as we go on. How he, he offended countless people, and they didn't forget. And since so many of them swallowed their hurt, after he was gone, it was usually the first thing out of their mouth if his name came up, as it invariably did. How he once told a colleague, I lost more money in the market today than you make in a year. How he once bumped an elderly survivor couple from the official American bus to Auschwitz, on the 50th anniversary of its liberation, added himself to the delegation alongside Elie Wiesel and left the weeping couple to beg Polish guards to let them into the camp so they wouldn't miss the ceremony. How he lobbied for the Nobel Peace Prize. That kind of thing, all the time, as if he needed to discharge a surplus of self every few hours to maintain his equilibrium. And the price he paid was very high. He destroyed his first marriage and his closest friendship. His defects of character cost him his dream job as Secretary of State, the position for which his strengths of character eminently qualified him. You can't untangle these things. I used to think that if Holbrook could just be fixed, a dose of self-restraint, a flash of inward light, and he could have done anything but that's an illusion. We are wholly ourselves. If you cut out the destructive element, you would kill the thing that made him almost great. As a member of the class of lesser beings who aspire to a good life, but not a great one, who find the very notion both daunting and distasteful, I can barely fathom the agony of that almost. Think about it the nonstop schedule, the calculation of every dinner table, the brain that burned all day and night, and the knowledge buried so deep he might have only sensed it as a physical ache that he had come up short of his own impossible exultation. I admired him for that readiness to suffer. His life was full of pleasures, but I never envied it. I'm trying to think what to tell you now that you have me talking. There's too much to say, and it all comes crowding in at once. His ambition, his loyalty, his cruelty, his fragility, his betrayals, his wounds, his wives, his girlfriends, his sons, his lunches. By dying, he stood up a 100 people, including me. He could not be alone. If you're still interested, I can tell you what I know from the beginning. I wasn't one of his close friends, but over the years, I made a study of him. You ask why? Not because he was extraordinary, though he was, and might have rivaled the record of his heroes if he and America had been in their prime together. Not because he was fascinating, though he was, and right this minute, somewhere in the world, 14 people are talking about him. Now and then I might let him speak for himself. That was something he knew how to do. But I won't relate his story for his sake. No, we want to hear, we want to see and feel what happened to America during Holbrook's life 
and we can see and feel more clearly by following someone who was almost great because his quest leads us deeper down the alleyways of power than the usual famous subjects, whom he knew, all of them. And his boisterous struggling lays open more human truths than the composed annals of the great. This was what Les Gelb must have meant when he said just after his friend's death, far better to write a novel about Richard C. Holbrook than a biography, let alone an obituary. What's called the American century was really just a little more than half a century, and that was the span of Holbrook's life. It began with the Second World War and the creative burst that followed, the United Nations, the Atlantic Alliance, containment, the free world, and it went through dizzying lows and highs until it expired the day before yesterday. The thing that brings on doom to great powers and great men is it simple hubris or decadence and squander, a kind of inattention, loss of faith, or just the passage of years? At some point, that thing set in. And so we are talking about an age gone by. It wasn't a golden age. There was plenty of folly and wrong, but I already miss it. The best about us was inseparable from the worst. Our feeling that we could do anything gave us the Marshall Plan and Vietnam the peace at Dayton, and the endless Afghan war. Our confidence and energy, our reach and grasp, our excess and blindness, they were not so different from Holbrook's. He was our man. That's the reason to tell you this story. That's why I can't get his voice out of my head. Thanks. <clears throat> So that's the prologue. And now uh, a bit about the book and the man. So this is my home office, totally overwhelmed by Holbrook. Uh, a few weeks after his death in December 2010, his widow gave me his personal papers, no strings attached. So within a week, these massive black filing cabinets were crowding my study making it impossible to get at some of my favorite books and even to open the door. <clears throat> so what was in those papers? Letters from Vietnam to his fiance, hundreds of letters, a great trove that amounted to a kind of uh, journal that he was keeping. Diaries, including audio diaries, and I'll play you a bit of one later on. Uh, letters, papers, fawning congratulations to Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, um, notes to his, uh, his, his girlfriends, notes to his sons, just a ton of material, not very uh, organized or persistent, but a huge ar array of stuff. And I spent a year or two going through them, and the whole time I was imagining him in my room because the presence was overwhelming. And I kept imagining him saying, who are you to be going through my diaries? And what the hell is taking you so long? In other words, he would be nothing if not ambivalent about having a biography written about him. And what was taking me so long was that I didn't know how to write the book. The book I was working on when I came into possession of the Holbrook papers called The Unwinding was not conventional nonfiction to tell the story of the decline of American democracy over the past few decades, which was the subject of the unwinding, I turned to the structure and style of a novelist, John Dos Passos, specifically his USA trilogy, which has a lot of Chicago in it. An instinct told me that a book about Richard Holbrook and the end of the American century would also need to be unconventional. One day I was driving on a highway in Connecticut and suddenly I heard a voice say, Holbrook? Yes, I knew him. And I wondered, what was that? Where did that come from? I was intrigued, I liked the sound of that voice. And as I thought about it, I realized that voice might provide a key to writing a book about Richard Holbrook. <clears throat> the book I realized I should write would be 
what you might call a novelistic biography, though everything in it would be true, or as true as I could make it. The only invention, sort of, would be the voice, because I wanted that, the voice that I heard in my head that day, and the voice I began to imagine as the narrator would be someone older than me, and wiser than me, and more seasoned than me. And the literary analogy I had in mind was Marlowe, the narrator of many of Joseph Conrad's novels. And my narrator would serve the same purpose. He would be able to comment on the story and provide context in sort of brief, opinionated asides, rather than laboriously plowing through large parts of history that the reader was half aware of, and in, in the process boring the reader to death, which I hate to say it, but a lot of biographies do. He would be authoritative, but not judgmental. Above all, he would convey a sense of intimate knowledge with the subject. Now, as a writer, I had to come by that knowledge the hard way through hundreds of interviews and thousands of pages of reading, but I wanted to leave all of that work outside the book so that you didn't feel it or see it. The narrator would tell the story as if he just somehow knew it an eyewitness to the whole saga. It would feel like you're being told a yarn, a very long yarn. And really, Holbrook himself demands this kind of book, because the cliche larger than life doesn't begin to describe him. And the traditional aloof stance of a biographer could never do him justice. His achievements, his failings, and his abiding value could only be brought to life through the eyes of a narrator who has seen the span of history that I have not, who has a keenly personal knowledge of America for all its dreams and defeats and its internal battles, and who could fully evoke Holbrook as a poignant agent of those dreams, embodying the spirit of an era, which is the era of the end of the American century. So why do I say larger than life? Well, first, there was his career. <clears throat> he served under every Democratic president from Kennedy to Obama. Hillary Clinton once told me that Holbrook was the zealot of American foreign policy. He showed up everywhere. He was always in the middle of the action. Here he is having a good time in South Vietnam <laughs> in 1963. That was his first post with the Foreign Service after he became a young Foreign Service officer. Um, he was sent to the Mekong Delta, which was at the time in 63, the hottest part of the war. The Viet Cong were getting stronger and stronger and Holbrook was there to hand out rice and building material and to do what we call counterinsurgency. At the time it was called pacification. He was working with Vietnamese counterparts to try to build up what were called strategic hamlets, these little uh, artificial and enforced uh, enclaves of civilians in order to protect them and to defend them against the Viet Cong, but of course they were a total disaster. Um, he also spent his time in Vietnam getting to know powerful people. That's Maxwell Taylor on the left at the tennis courts of the most fashionable club in Saigon. Um, Holbrook had an instinct for finding the powerful and impressing them, and not just by flattering them, although he doled out flattery, but by telling them what he really thought. And what he really thought was that the war was being lost, and he sensed that incredibly early. He was 22 years old, and the senior civilian in this one province in the Mekong Delta, senior American civilian, and he saw that all the assessments and all the optimistic reports were false, and he tried to change the, the perception of his superiors and met with great resistance. Um, and he went through what he later called a, a sequence of doubts about our, the war we were fighting in Vietnam, first doubting the reports, the assessments, and then the tactics, and then the strategy, and finally, the entire basis for the war. 
This didn't take a couple of weeks. This took four years. Because when you're on the inside of government, psychologically, it's almost impossible for you to fundamentally question what you're doing, especially if you're in the middle of a war. And yet, if you follow Holbrook through these years, it's hard not to be impressed by the clarity of his thinking and by how quickly uh, he saw the, the reality of Vietnam. He didn't turn against the war, though, for quite some time uh, because he was on the inside. Then he went back to Washington and began to climb up the hierarchy of the government. Here he is with Lyndon Johnson in the White House. At this point, I think Holbrook is 25 years old. He's the guy in the glasses, sort of in the middle of the picture. Um, in 68, having gotten to know some very important diplomats like Avril Harriman, he joined the Paris Peace Talks as the youngest member of the American delegation. And those talks went nowhere. And after the election of Richard Nixon, Holbrook left government for a few years. This is him in the 70s when he was the editor of Foreign Policy Magazine, but always waiting for the next shot at getting back into government and rising up and having real power because ambition was the, the motor of his entire life. He once told a girlfriend that he wanted to be the next Henry Kissinger. That was the end of that relationship because she actually knew Henry Kissinger. <clears throat> And he said this even though he thought Henry Kissinger was a, a cynical and amoral man. And Kissinger, in turn, once called Holbrook the most viperous man I know around this town, which is really something coming from Henry Kissinger. <clears throat> At the tender age of 35, Holbrook became Jimmy Carter's assistant secretary of state for East Asia, the youngest one in history. He participated in the normalization of relations with China. And he also engaged in a bureaucratic death struggle with Zbigniew Brzezinski. You can kind of sense that Holbrook is more getting on the bruised end of that struggle from this picture at the Great Wall, where he's on the right looking a little bit downcast, and Brzezinski is looking triumphant in the center, because Brzezinski, number one, is going to be the American who, normalize, who carries out the normalization with China, and number two, has just humiliated Richard Holbrook, who he saw as a kind of bureaucratic threat. Under Bill Clinton, he became the one American official who made Bosnia his single-minded mission. And in the, that period in the 90s, I think the two aspects of his character, egotism and idealism, were in their best balance. They were working together because neither of them could live without the other. If you were egotistical without being idealistic, you would be destructive. If you were idealistic without being egotistical, you'd be feckless. You need both. Sometimes they got out of whack in Holbrook, but in the 90s in Bosnia, he was like a laser-guided missile focused on ending that war, and he did end it by negotiating the Dayton Peace Accords in 1995, ending the worst slaughter in Europe since World War II. As Clinton's ambassador to the UN in the late 90s, he kind of saved the organization by getting Jesse Helms and the Republican Congress to release a billion dollars in unpaid American dues. And then, at the end of his career, he had one last chance and became President Obama's man on Afghanistan and tried to find a way to end the war by talking to the enemy, the Taliban. But as you can see from this picture, Obama didn't care for him. Biden didn't care for him. I mean, look at the body language. Holbrook made enemies of his colleagues more than enemies of the Taliban. The Taliban were ready to talk to him. His colleagues didn't like him, found him long-winded and melodramatic and um, trading too much on his reputation. And it was really, <clears throat> the end of both his career and his life. Obama disliked him so much that he'd left Holbrook off presidential trips to Kabul, which was quite a slight since Holbrook was the guy who was supposed to be negotiating the end of the war. And the end of his life was just as much of a drama as all the rest of it. His aorta burst during a meeting in the office of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, the office that he had yearned and strived for all his life. 
and at age 69, he died in action, you could say, of a broken heart. And then there was his character, his flamboyant, maddening, mesmerizing character. He wanted to swallow life whole. He made a lot of money on Wall Street in between government jobs, and he spent it profligately. He was a bit of a star chaser. Here he is with one of his girlfriends, Diane Sawyer. The others were not quite at that level, but all of them had some uh, sort of social uh, attraction to him. Here he is with Hakeem Olajuwon and Dikembe Mutombo during his stint as UN ambassador. Here he is poking a finger in the chest of the Dalai Lama. Here he is with his pal, Robert De Niro. He spent a lot of time with media people, with Hollywood people, with Wall Street people, with athletes. He loved adventure. He ate too much. He saw more movies than most of us have ever heard of, and he was not a snob about it. His favorite was There's Something About Mary. He had numerous affairs. He was a sexist who only really revealed himself to women. His life reminds me of those protagonists in the great 19th century novels making their way up through the imperial capital and trying to prevail against an adversarial world. As I said in the prologue, he never made it to the top, never achieved all that he thought he could, and the main reason was himself. At times he seemed to be a comic villain, but in the end he turned out to be a tragic hero. His egotism made some people detest him, and his idealism made other people revere him. He was one of the few Americans at the top of power who truly cared about the rest of the world, especially about people in places where there was great suffering. He was the son of Jewish refugees from Hitler and Stalin, and he had a lifelong passion for, the, for humanitarian causes. And once he got his teeth into one of them, he never let go. Persistence was uh, in his DNA. And I don't think he ever opened the Bible, but there is a biblical verse that I think describes Holbrook, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, from Ecclesiastes. He was critical of the militarization of our foreign policy, starting in Vietnam and extending all the way to Afghanistan. But he also believed that America was essentially a force for good and that America always had to get involved and be in the lead or nothing would happen. The results during his life were as often harmful as they were helpful. This is a story that begins in Vietnam and ends in Afghanistan. One thing I learned in writing about Holbrook was how utterly human government is. And Holbrook is such a transparent character that you see uh, the dramas of government work and of power struggles clearly and intimately. How decisions at the highest level reflect human character and relationships with all their flaws and their irrationality and ignorance. How arbitrary events of the greatest importance can be. Holbrook once wrote in his diary, often one has to make decisions based on 2% of the information one ought to have, to have. So one needs a set of guiding principles, a value system, and rock hard integrity, or else one is buffeted by public opinion polls, pressure, and the confusion of the bureaucracy's competing claims. Without character, one can lose one's way. And Throughout the book, the example, the, the clearest example of this, this human side of government is Holbrook's relationship with Anthony Lake, who was in his class in the Foreign Service, who was in Vietnam with him. Here's Lake as a young man in Vietnam, who was Holbrook's best friend, tennis partner. And then after a personal betrayal that I won't describe in detail because I hope you'll read about it, they became mortal enemies, such enemies that, here they are working for Cyrus Vance in the Jimmy Carter State Department, such enemies that when it came to Bosnia, it affected policy. It got in the way of every meeting. 
Uh, and after one meeting in the White House, a young official came back to the State Department and having watched Holbrook and Lake go at it for an hour, said to a colleague, what happened to those guys in Vietnam? It was as if government was so intense and personal that it was in their blood and uh, was, and here you can sort of see what's happened to them with the look in Tony Lake's face as he eyes Holbrook. Uh, this is when Lake was Bill Clinton's national security advisor. Um, Holbrook was a diplomat, but this is not primarily a book about foreign policy. It's really a portrait of an era in American life, the era when America thought of itself as a leader of the free world. Here's Holbrook at the end of his life, and I'm gonna end by just playing you a short clip from a diary that he kept on a micro cassette recorder at the end of his life. This is in 2010, just a few months before his death, and I'm really sorry for the bad sound quality, but this is a guy whose voice is starting to break down, speaking into a primitive micro cassette recorder with some background noise, but I think you'll be able to hear, hear it. He's talking about uh, having just gone to see the musical South Pacific. Uh, Monday, August 23rd, 7 a.m. Yesterday, the 22nd, Kati and I went to the final performance of the revival of South Pacific at Lincoln Center with Frank Rich and Alex Witchell and Linda Janklow. It was a fantastic night, afternoon in the theater, maybe the best ever. Uh, a fantastic production, which I found, found immensely moving. Men were crying, myself included. Uh, I tried to understand why that show had such an enormous emotional impact on us. Uh, for me, it was the combination of the beauty of the show and its music and the capturing in that show of so many moments in American history. The show itself, opening in New York and the height of New York's greatness, 1949. The theme, Americans at war in a distant land or islands in the South Pacific. The sense of loss of American optimism and, and our feeling that we could do anything. The contrast with today. It was very powerful. And I kept thinking of where we were today in our nation. Our lack of confidence in our own ability to lead compared to where we were in 1949 when it came out, evoking it air only five years or seven years earlier when we had gone to the most distant corners of the globe and saved civilization. So as you can tell, he's, he's at the end, and that was three months before he died. Like Holbrook, the American century combined heroic and destructive impulses, nobility and hubris, the sense that we could do anything and the impulse to do everything. But I really only understood what my book was about six years after Holbrook's death on election night in 2016 when I suddenly realized that the era he embodied was over, that we were entering something new and unknown and diminished, and I suddenly understood that what I was writing was now history. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions. Is there a microphone? There's or? a couple microphones, so just give us a sec. We see some questions here in the front. Okay. There's a lady in the middle here. I got that side. 
Hi, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that Obama and Biden didn't like Hol Mr. Holbrook, but obviously I assume Hillary Clinton did, or and that's how he got chosen, and because of the experiences with Bill Clinton, is that right? Um, he, why was he chosen for the Afghanistan job? He and Hillary Clinton had a close relationship. They were very loyal to each other, um, and Obama did not want Holbrook in his administration, but Hillary Clinton was his Secretary of State and she was going to get her way. So she appointed him, and partly out of the experience of the 90s under her husband in Bosnia, but I think also because she, uh, I would say, loved him and also needed him because he had the foreign policy experience that she did not, and she kind of counted on him. But then she ended up having to cover for him over and over again when people would complain uh, to either the National Security Advisor or to her. And Obama at one point was about to fire him. And Hillary went to, Ob to the Oval Office and said, you can fire him over your Secretary of State's objections. And so Obama, being Obama, was you know, lowered the temperature and said, let's wait a few months. He never fired him, but I, I almost wish he had because it would have been better f for Holbrook either never to have gotten the job or to have been gotten rid of quickly than to have this humiliation drawn out. And I, there are scenes in the book that do not bring out the best in Barack Obama. For, even though he had all kinds of good reasons to find Holbrook distasteful, almost physically distasteful, this big lumbering man talking too much, flattering Obama. You don't flatter Barack Obama, that doesn't work. Obama treated him horribly uh, and undercut him from the very start, made it clear to everyone around him that he did not like Richard Holbrook, which meant they didn't have to worry about Richard Holbrook. It would have been better for Holbrook to have been cut loose early. Instead, two years, the last two years of his career and his life were a kind of a hell for him. And on the very last day, just before that meeting with Hillary Clinton in the Secretary of State's office where his aorta tore, he was in the White House meeting with David Axelrod, trying to get, for one last time, a meeting with the president and being told no. So it all was kind of crashing down on him at the very end. But Hillary Clinton was his friend and his patron in the last years. I know the book's not you know, primarily about foreign policy about him, but I was just wondering what his views were on the Middle East, especially being a, a son of uh, Holocaust victims or, or yeah. survivors and what he thought about Israel. Well, let's start with his relation to being Jewish, which he didn't know about until he was maybe 18. He didn't know his parents' story until much later. These were refugees who erased the past, as many refugees did, and wanted to start over as Americans after the war. So Holbrook went to Quaker Sunday School in Scarsdale, New York. He didn't go to Temple. He was not bar mitzvah. He had no uh, sense of being Jewish. Um, but it began to come out through his career. He became ambassador to Germany and one of the, under Clinton, and an official said, look, are you Jewish or not? Because if you are, you have to say so. And Holbrook said, why do I have to say so? And the guy said, you're going to be ambassador to Germany. That's why. Um, so he then kind of made being Jewish a bit more of his public persona, but never with any cultural or religious affinity. And on Israel, he saw Israel as a, just as a trap. Uh, and his political instincts told him that if he got involved in Israel, it would hurt his political career, his chances of becoming Secretary of State, because he would offend one group or another, and it would cost him. So he kept a long arm's length on Israel. He supported the Iraq war, but I think for pretty cynical political reasons. He thought that if he was going to become John Kerry's Secretary of State in 2004, he had to support the war. But as soon as the war started, he just kept it at arm's length and never really wanted to talk about it. So the Middle East was the one part of the world that he was not interested in, but it was a kind of strategic non-interest. It was because it would not have been good for him, and he avoided it. Oh, right here. Yes. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm a great admirer of your work. Um, Thank you. Particularly, I appreciate, as a lifelong reader of Orwell, your, your uh, compilation there. 
Um, I didn't realize until just recently that uh, Orwell was writing a how-to manual, um, which feels like uh, an ah. instruction guide to the current days. Well, I've, um, got a, I've got a piece coming out in the Atlantic um, over the summer about Orwell in 1984, which is what you're talking about. Yep. Uh, the subtitle of your book says it's the end of the American century, which implies that something else is beginning. What's beginning? I think what's beginning is great power competition in which we are one of many. We are maybe the biggest and strongest, but we're just one of many. And it'll be very difficult for a, a new president to make the case that we need to go back to the period where our alliances, the rules that we helped write after World War II, the institutions that we helped create, should really be at the forefront of our foreign policy. Instead, I think Trump is not an aberration. I think Trump is a symptom of a turn in American foreign policy as well as domestic toward a kind of, uh, it's, not, it's not quite isolationism, but a, a hard-boiled attitude toward the rest of the world. What's in it for us? And um, although during the low moments of Holbrook's career, you might long for America to be less than the leader of the world, I don't think the alternative is going to be better. I think it's it's something to to regret and to fear. Um, I think if Trump loses next year, there's more of a chance that a Democratic president could at least um, make the case for in for engagement with the world and for internationalism. But if Trump wins, then I think two terms will fundamentally change the course of our our role in the world, and it will be something like, <laughs> I hate to say it, but the years before World War I, when there were relatively evenly matched great powers who were in competition for, uh, for resources and, and influence, uh, which is sort of where we are. We're, we're moving into that right now, I think, especially with Russia and China. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I'm curious, you said that uh, Holbrook was prescient about the uh, Vietnamese War and long before that. Did he offer any alternatives to what was going on in Vietnam? I mean, you can sort of see a gradual um, shift in position. It's not overnight, as I said. This is something that almost required a fundamental rethinking of what it meant to be American. If you're an American young foreign service officer during the Kennedy years, you think we are on the side of the good guys. I mean, it'd be almost impossible not to. That's, you wouldn't join the foreign service otherwise. And John F. Kennedy is your inspiration. And you're going out into the world on behalf of democracy and helping people around the world. At first, he thought we should not be using heavy firepower. We're making enemies instead of killing enemies and we need to focus on the civilian side of counterinsurgency, which is uh, local elections, schools, agriculture, all those things that, go, that are part of the non-military side of counterinsurgency. He wanted those emphasized, which he ended up doing again on Afghanistan. But by the time he came back to the United States in 66 and saw what the war was doing at home, he realized we would never be there long enough to prevail because number one, Hanoi was not gonna give up and number two, the American people were not gonna put up with it. So we needed to find a way out. And for him, the way out was negotiation. So he wanted total halt of the bombing uh, in 68 and unconditional peace talks with the North Vietnamese, but it took five more years for the war to end, which is one of the tragedies of that war. I think we have time for two more. Okay. Hi, George. Um, it's Tenny. Uh, Sorry? Why, it's Tenny from Pro Providence in Boston. Hey, um, how are you? <laughs> good. <laughs> why did he succeed in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia? What was his contribution there? I think I would say three or four reasons. One. It was the, the moment when our power was uncontested. Russia was in a state of collapse. 
China was not yet a great power, and the Europeans had been watching and letting this war burn for three years, and they were no longer capable of doing anything about it. The real problem was Bill Clinton, who did not want to get involved, and it took a lot to get him to get involved. Second, Holbrook's personality was well suited to the Balkans. As he once said to a Bosnian I interviewed, you know about carrots and sticks? You know, you give incentives and then you give disincentives. Well, in this country, you need a hammer or a sledgehammer. So coming in with all of Holbrook's force was probably the, a lot of diplomats had passed through Sarajevo and tried to be reasonable and to listen and got nowhere. Holbrook came in and immediately the Bosnian people who had been suffering for three years of this terrible siege sensed just by his physical energy, this is a man who's gonna try to solve our problem. And it was that force of will that finally broke Milosevic and the Serbs who were after all not a great army, they were thugs. But they were thugs who had blackmailed Europe into allowing them to commit genocide under their eyes. Holbrook called Milosevic's bluff and won. Um, so I think he, the combination of his personality and the context of the 90s when we were really bestriding the world uh, gave him uh, a, that, that triumph and that was his you know, claim to history. One over on this side, George. Okay. You mentioned uh, Trump a little bit. Uh, I was wondering if you could predict a little bit about um, what he would feel about the Trump administration, and maybe in particular, you know, Trump um, in the last few years has talked a lot about the deep state, even yeah. if it's maybe just a re rhetorically. Like, what do you think that Holbrook would have thought of that? Yeah, Holbrook would have utterly loathed Trump and his foreign policy. I think he would have he wouldn't have been able to understand it because Holbrook was such a creature of this earlier period when we were in the lead and we had to be in the lead and we had to have allies and we had to have institutions and treaties. He, I think he wouldn't have understood Trump and for that reason, like a lot of Democrats, he might have had a hard time defeating Trump because Holbrook lived in this elite world Washington and New York, and the feelings of people out in the country who elected Trump were not obvious to him. They were the ones out, remember, whose sons and daughters were doing the fighting and dying in Iraq and Afghanistan. And one thing I do hold Holbrook to account for, and his class of people, was they were sending other people's children to fight while they were getting rich uh, and wielding power. And that you could call it a kind of decadence, is part of what led to Trump. So you could say that there was a, a quality among the ruling class of, in those last years that didn't see it coming and that kind of helped bring it on. Um, and so I think Holbrook would be, he would have a lot of eloquent and powerful things to say, but he would not fundamentally be able to confront and defeat Trump because I don't think he would understand the world we're living in right now. I do think that if he'd been around during the Syria war of the Obama years, he would have been able to do something because that's exactly the kind of situation that Holbrook was, was great at. But as you know, Barack Obama didn't want to get caught in the quicksand of Syria. And maybe two more, including my daughter, because I'm going to be with her for the rest of the weekend and I'll be hearing about it if I don't call on her. She'll get the last one so then. So <laughs> if, if there's no one else who has... I just have a... Okay. Whose uh, inspiration was it to move from Paris to Dayton, Ohio? It was Holbrook's. It was. And the reason was... I'm from Dayton. Yeah, I mean, and Dayton was the, the place for it because Paris, diplomats love Paris. They love going out to dinner and going to museums and they don't want it to end. So they talk and talk and talk while wars continue. Dayton was a military base. The Europeans hated being there. The food was terrible. The wine was terrible. It was cold, it was miserable, and Holbrook knew that if he forced all these characters from the Balkans and from the European powers to sit on an American military base in Ohio, they would have to come to a deal. <laughs> and we would be able to control it. So it was actually part of his genius, I think, to insist on Dayton. And last, Julia. I have a question about one of the slides. Yes. Um, Hurry. One I of them has 
Richard Holbrook talking to someone, I forget who, and that someone looks like this. Holbrook is stroking his chin? No, no, the someone he's talking to. Do they have any tension between them, or oh. like, ah. are they talking about a tight subject? I think a lot of those pictures show a lot of tension. The one between Holbrook and Tony Lake with Bill Clinton in the room, the one between Holbrook, Obama, and Biden, where o Obama has literally turned away from Holbrook and is looking at Biden, and Biden seems to be staring daggers at Holbrook. The interesting thing is Biden and Holbrook agreed on everything, so they disliked each other, of course. Uh, th this is, these pictures show you what goes on in government. It can destroy people. It can really tear people apart. It's, uh, it was sobering to get inside the life of someone who gave his life to American government and diplomacy and to see what it costs. Anyway, the book is for sale. You will be the first people to purchase it because it's actually not even out yet. So I hope you will meet me out at the table. Thanks so much for coming.